Acoustic panels are hard to make, but are they worth it? Reverb. So much. Oh, hello. Thank you for joining me. And just to be transparent right up front, this is not a step-by-step -step DIY acoustic panel build video per se. I will roughly go over the steps I took to build them and the issues I ran into along the way, but this video is more about taking you all on a little journey, going over what I found after venturing deep down the rabbit hole of acoustic treatment. And I mean deep. What started this journey was my stupidity. You're welcome. Remember this dum-dum who decided to put foam squares up because they'd just been gathering dust for years and it wouldn't cost him any money? <laughs> well, after doing some tests and just listening more closely to how little they were affecting the sound of this room, I knew I needed to stop being a lazy dum-dum and look into treatment that actually worked. Andrew Robinson mentioned in a recent video of his how acoustic foam squares don't really do much unless you plan on covering every square inch of the wall and ceiling with the stuff. He's 100% correct. This foam is good if you cover every inch of the inside of a little vocal booth, for example. Sure, but that's about it. So back to the acoustic journey, let me tell you. There are countless videos out there regarding acoustic treatment, the science behind it, what's good or bad, what to avoid, what to definitely do, etc. times infinity. But the most difficult part about going down this rabbit hole is you'll find one thing you latch onto, then not much later in your research you find something that is completely contradictory to the other thing. It is maddening to say the least. But before I even began to contemplate building my own acoustic panels, I reached out to a few acoustic treatment companies to see if we could strike a deal. Because once acoustic treatment is there, it's pretty much gonna stay. So I thought I could then entice some companies to hook me up with a few acoustic panels that would then be seen by millions of adoring fans with every subsequent video that I recorded in this testing theater. Hey, I can dream, can I? So after I fired off those emails, can you guess who got back to me? No one, not a single one. Ugh, I was already behind schedule with this testing theater anyway, so taking that plunge into DIY acoustic panels would mean even more time added to the completion of this theater. And researching DIY acoustic panels is its own YouTube rabbit hole. But even that meant I had to be cautious of the science behind what materials they were using, etc. Because just a fair warning, there are lots of DIY instructional videos out there from woodworking experts and other handyman channels that sure make the panels look pretty. But then I looked at the comment section and saw so many complaints from those who knew a thing or two about audio or even actual audio engineers saying they were spreading misinformation. Ugh, again. But here's what's so tough about me even uploading a video like this out there on YouTube. I bet what I'm about to say contradicts somebody else's video. But look. I am far from an expert. I am not an acoustician. I never set out to preach in my videos that it's my way or the highway. You make your system sound the way you want it, but I sure hope that you trust my judgment to some degree since I spent a long time researching this topic so that you wouldn't have to. So let's first give credit where credit is due. For building my DIY panels, I was drawn to this video here called How to Make Real Acoustic Panels from John Heiss, which I'll put in the description below. He graciously answered my questions in the comments section, including steering me to another YouTube channel that he goes to for knowing about science behind acoustic panels, which is Acoustic Insider. Kindness goes a long way, folks. So why fight with your fellow YouTubers when you can gain and value what insight from them? Am I right? John specifically suggested this video titled Acoustic Panel Placement. Do you need an air gap behind your panels? Long story short, yes, you do need an air gap, or at least you should 
if your space allows for it. Why? Because it essentially doubles the effectiveness of the panel. But here's the thing, the amount of space in that air gap should equal the thickness of your panel. If you have a panel two inches thick, for example, mount it in such a way where there is a two inch air gap. But if your air gap exceeds the thickness of the panel itself, say you had a four inch air gap while only using a two inch thick panel, it can introduce dips in the mid frequencies. No bueno. He goes over this extensively in the video with charts and graphs and the works. So I highly suggest you watch it for yourself. But only after you watch this video until the end, right? By the end of the video, he mentions that the most effective thickness for acoustic panels to absorb high, mid, and bass frequencies is six inches. Wow. My testing theater is only 11 feet wide, so having six inch thick panels with a six inch air gap on top of that would just be too close for comfort. But if you're watching this and you have a particularly wide home theater space to where you can subtract a foot in from each side and still be okay, by all means, go for it. Anywho, back to John's video about actually building the panels, he uses some five and a half inch thick rock wool insulation you can get at a hardware store. So almost six inches, so that's great. But even then, that's still a bit thick for my little theater, so I personally went with some three and a half inch thick insulation I got from Home Depot. Something is better than nothing, and three and a half inches is better than two inches, especially with an additional three and a half inch air gap. It's still gonna be a tight squeeze, but I can manage with my panels coming out a total of seven inches from the walls. But one huge reason I went with John's build is because they were made to be mobile, connected to floor stands, which is rare to see. For me, this would be perfect, since I'll be changing speakers out a lot, changing speaker configurations, so the positions of my side panels can be flexible with that. And it would also be that much easier to get the desired air gap if they're just standing on the floor. Another reason I liked John's design is that his frames are only 15 inches wide, which is wide enough for your typical in-wall installation from the hardware store. A lot of prefab acoustic panels are 24 inches wide because that's the typical width of a sheet of Owens Corning 703 insulation, the industry standard in the world of acoustics. But Owens Corning 703 insulation is not cheap. And to make them as thick as I want them, I would have to double up on a standard two inch thick sheet. Can you see why I went in another direction? The other convenient thing about getting some insulation from Home Depot is that they come in sheets. So I knew I needed to make frames that could accommodate a space that was 15 inches wide, 47 inches long, and three and a half inches deep. John definitely has an incredible woodworking shop with all the necessary tools to make the job a little more. Did you hear that thunder? John definitely has an incredible woodworking shop with all the necessary tools to make the job go a little bit more smoothly. I have access to my brother-in-law's shop, which is not too shabby, but my woodworking skills are definitely subpar compared to John, so I had to make some modifications to my build. Since John went a little bit fancier on some aspects that I just couldn't pull off. To start, one modification I made to the frames themselves is that I went with a three and a half inch thick MDF instead of plywood. I figured if almost all the speaker manufacturers out there build their speakers out of MDF, why not build my frames out of that as well? But just a warning right out the gate, since MDF is fiberboard, essentially wood fibers compressed into sheets, it is more fragile than plywood. More on that later. Since I have access to a table saw, I got a couple four foot by eight foot sheets of MDF at Home Depot, knowing I could cut down these sheets into three and a half inch planks, making up the long and short sides of the frames, as well as cut some support beams that would span the middle section. As you can see here, without the support beam, it bows in quite a bit, which is something I don't want happening when I get to the step of pulling the fabric nice and tight before stapling it down. So with some wood glue and brad nails, I built the frame. Stepping back a bit, if you don't have access to a table saw, I honestly wouldn't recommend getting giant sheets of MDF or plywood to cut down into little strips. A table saw is absolutely necessary when dealing with assembly lining something like this, where you have to have precise widths of each plank. Otherwise, you might wanna go for some long pieces of wood that are already cut to the width you want, and then you just have to cut them to the right length. Next up was the stand. And I'll just tell you right now, the first test was a failure. You see, I liked how John's stands come out at a slight angle, giving the panel more stability, being supported both in front and behind the panel itself. So I started with a 10 degree angle on top and joined the two pieces with 45 degree angles, and even added a nice 30 degree angle off the bottom piece to give it a nice tapered look. 
Well, I forgot to account for the 10 degrees that I shaved off the top, so the result would have been a leaning panel of pizza, which would just topple over. I also tried screwing the pieces together, which John did in his build, but it ended up splitting the MDF quite easily. Remember how I said MDF is pretty fragile? Yeah. So it was nothing but brad nails after that. Back to the drawing board, I took a 15 inch piece of MDF and still cut 10 degrees off the top and still cut 45 degrees off the bottom. Turns out a 15 inch piece of MDF sticks out about two and a half inches past the front when 10 degrees have been shaved off the top. Since I need a three and a half inch air gap from the wall, the back of the stand needs to allow for that. So doing some quick math here, a three and a half inch air gap plus a three and a half inch thick panel plus two and a half inches that it sticks out from the front means I need to work with a nine and a half inch bottom piece. So once I had 16 pieces cut to nine and a half inches, I then needed to account for that 10 degrees off the top. So I then cut a 55 degree angle off the bottom pieces. Ah, ain't geometry great? While the glue was drying in the adjacent garage, I drew lines on them where the support beams would go. I then cut eight 12 inch pieces to act as the support beams. Then I assembled them all together with more glue and brads. I then put some glue on the tops of the stand and carefully set the panel on top, finishing it off with some more brads. I built out one frame all the way first, just to make sure all the pieces fit properly and sure enough, the panel was nice and vertical. It seemed pretty stable too, which was such a sigh of relief. Since I didn't want any distractions or anything altering the picture quality of the TV in my theater, and to give the frames and stands a nice seal, I went ahead and spray painted them with some flat black enamel. No gloss or else the light from the TV might reflect off that gloss too much. When dealing with black spray paint, wear gloves so you don't get any on your skin. Brought to you by the Dum Dum Coalition. Don't be a dumb dumb. And now, the fabric. This is another alteration I made since John used some really cool spline techniques on the front and rear of his panels. If you are capable of working with the precision of splines, please do it. It looks much cleaner than staples. In my future dream home theater, I will definitely attempt to do what John did because the result is very elegant, worthy of a high-end studio or home theater space. But since this is my testing theater built for utility and not looks, I just went ahead and laid out the fabric, stapled the backside, cut off the excess fabric, flipped it over, put the insulation in, stapled the front side, and cut off the excess once again. When dealing with insulation, don't forget to wear eye protection, a mask, and gloves because that sh can irritate every orifice and your skin. Thank you. I then repeated that several times until I had a total of eight panels on stands. Next up were the four panels without stands that would be mounted to the ceiling. Since I wasn't dealing with stands with these panels, after stapling the fabric on the back and putting in the insulation, I then wrapped the fabric all the way around the frame and stapled it also to the back. Note. After doing that and seeing how much nicer it looked, it made me wish I would have taken the time to wrap it all the way around the panels on stands too. But since I'm dealing with stands, I would have to make some precise cuts to the fabric so it would be pulled through the holes of the stands, etc. It was definitely some laziness on my part, which I kind of regret. If I feel up for it down the road, I may just remove the staples from the fronts and rewrap them to look nicer. If you're thinking about putting panels like these in your living room or theater space, again, do the spline technique like John did, or take the time to wrap them all the way around the frame, dealing with the trickiness of the stands getting in the way. Because the back can still look ugly, since no one's gonna see it. So now that I had four ceiling panels ready to go, it was time to mount them. I was thinking about suspending them with hooks and chains initially, but the more I thought about how fragile and brittle MDF can be, I decided I wanted something to clamp onto the frames instead. So I went with clamps. And I chose these little DeWalt clamps from Home Depot specifically because of this little hole here. That way I can attach either a hook or something to it for easier suspension. I spray painted these with that same flat black enamel to better blend in with the darkness when I'm watching a movie. While I was about to assemble my Jimmy rigged ceiling mounts, I noticed something that I didn't plan on working this well when I chose these DeWalt clamps. As you can see here, when I set the width of the clamp to three and a half inches, the full length of the clamp happens to also be seven Seven inches. So that automatically gave me my three and a half inch air gap. What a little happy accident that was. We don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents. So just to make sure my plan worked, I assembled the rigs with toggle bolts, washers, and a chain link, measured and made marks 
for one ceiling panel, installed the rigs into the ceiling, and with the help of my wife, got the panel in place. Voila! And thank goodness it was nice and sturdy. Turns out, after all was said and done, the air gap actually turned out to be four inches and not three and a half. Not perfect, but it'll do. So I proceeded with the other three panels. I have a total of 12 panels and the layout is as follows. Three up front on the ceiling, one spanning horizontally in the back, two on each sidewall at the first reflection point, two on each sidewall at the second reflection point, and a third on each sidewall at the reflection point of the surround backs. Wait, what's a reflection point? It's literally that. Of reflection. The simplest and most common way to find your first reflection point is to sit in your main listening position, have someone else hold up a small mirror, slowly move along the sidewall, and stop when you see the reflection of the tweeter of the closest speaker. Make a mark of it because that's where the center of your first panel should go. Then tell your mirror helper to keep going along that wall and stop when you see the reflection of the tweeter of the further front speaker. That's where your second reflection panel should be placed. And repeat the process on the other wall. And the proof is in the pudding, folks. I know I played some of it at the beginning, but here it is again, just for comparison. Some final thoughts on the subject after having gone on this journey. Yeah, MDF has some good acoustic properties and most manufacturers use it to keep costs down to you, the consumer, true. But if and when I build my dream home theater on my future property, I'm gonna go with plywood or something sturdier and less brittle than MDF. I would be able to hang ceiling panels from hooks that way, which would be nicer looking in the end. I would also attempt the splining technique that John did. It just takes this particular style of panel and elevates it to a new level. And if I'm dealing with my dream home theater, with components and speakers being more permanent, I'll try and find a way to mount these panels on the wall with an air gap. That's something you might wanna try as well if this has inspired you to take the plunge into DIY acoustic panels. Try and build some sort of supporting bracket that gives you the correct amount of air gap off the wall. It's worth trying if you're into that sort of DIY challenge. But lastly, when dealing with home theaters specifically, acoustic treatment that affects high, mid, and bass frequencies I would highly recommend if at all possible. I would recommend watching that video I referred to earlier from Andrew Robinson, since he has some great ideas to build off of if you are needing ideas to create acoustic treatment in your living room without it looking like acoustic treatment. Since I know most of you don't have a dedicated home theater space, or you have a significant other who can't stand the look of acoustic panels. Otherwise, sure, if you're needing acoustic treatment in your office to cut down on reflections of mid frequencies of your own voice when you're on Zoom calls, for recording videos, or just to help with reflecting noise in general, two inch thick panels mounted right on the walls and the ceiling will provide some difference, sure. But when dealing with music or movies, you're dealing with frequencies within the whole spectrum of human hearing. So you gotta make it thick and you need that air gap. And the thicker you get, the more expensive it gets when it comes to prefab panels. So get a hold of your woodworking buddy and ask for some help or attempt to make some DIY panels yourself because the markup on prefab panels is so insane. Making 12 panels three and a half inches thick and almost four feet long was not cheap by any means, but it still cost me about a fourth of the price if I had gotten prefab panels of the same size. Yes, while waiting for glue and paint to dry or needing to redo a step that didn't turn out right, it took me about a week to completely finish the project but I am so happy with the result. It was totally worth it in the end. And there you have it. Thank you for coming along on this acoustic treatment journey of mine. I sure hope you learned something along the way or were inspired to start your own journey. Once again, a big shout out to John Heiss and his well-detailed build video, as well as Acoustics Insider with the science behind acoustics that I could get behind. Please check out their channels, get schooled, and get inspired. As always, Please be kind to each other out there. Don't just watch TV and movies, experience them. And of course, always be listening.